Next uh, to a minister, the foulest job in the world belongs to that of the school teacher. <laughs> Having fallen steadily in dignity and authority, both continue to wear their hearts out trying to perform the impossible. How much the world asks of them and how little they can actually deliver. The clergyman is in the business of trying to keep his clients out of hell. And if he manages to save one-eighth of one percent of his flock, he is deemed to be doing magnificently. The teacher's job is to get the great masses to think. And thinking is precisely what the masses, children or otherwise, are congenitally and eternally incapable of doing. In order to accomplish the impossible, the art of pedagogy has become a matter of... Uh, puerile magic, a thing of preposterous secrets. Every year some new craze is put forth in the name of solving the teaching enigma. And no matter how crazy the cure, I can assure you that there is an almost limitless supply of school superintendents ready to swallow it. As a result, as a result, teaching has become a, a, a thing in itself. And certainly, a thing apart from the subject matter. Furthermore, its mastery becomes a special business, a sort of uh, a sort of transcendental high jumping. The idea is to get teachers so well versed in this new technique, whatever whatever it might be, that any and every teacher will be able to teach any subject to any child just as any dentist is able to pull any tooth from any jaw. All of this, all of this, it seems to me, is in sharp contrast to the old theory of teaching, which held that if a teacher was told to teach, oh, say, geography, that what he ought to do was master the facts of his subject and then get himself a good stout stick. Thus equipped, uh, the teacher was ready to face to face any test of his natural pedagogical genius. I was grounded in this process at the Friedrich Knapp Institute of Baltimore, and despite the eloquence of those who trumpet newer ideas, I lean heavily to this day in favor of it. To be sure, the old method was crude and rough, and at times, at times, uh, yes, even, even cruel. But it had two capital advantages over any system that has ever succeeded it. In the first place, it was simple enough and direct enough so that even the stupidest child could understand it. Secondly, it tested the teacher's actual capacity to teach and not merely his technical virtuosity, such as it might be. As a matter of fact, there really was no technique for that teacher to master, and hence none for him to hide behind. Now, I admit that I have not inhabited a classroom in, in quite a while. Nonetheless, I would argue that the ability to impart knowledge has little, if anything, to do with technical methods. What a good teacher must have besides some knowledge, and that sharp stick, is a natural talent for dealing with children and an ability to put things in a way that they can comprehend. More than any of this, what a true teacher must have is a deep belief in, nay, nay, I would say a real passion for, the importance of the thing being taught. Let, let me put it this way. A teacher who is soaked in his subject has enthusiasm for his subject, and while enthusiasm cannot be taught, it certainly can be contagious. <laughs> Consider briefly penmanship. I mention penmanship because I actually do believe that legible handwriting is a highly useful thing for a young person to acquire, <laughs> in fact. In fact, it is one of the few things taught in school that can actually help a person make a living. There was a time when this subject was was in the hands of passionate penmen, teachers with curly, patent leather hair and faraway eyes. 
Some of you must remember them. Asses all. Pathetic imbeciles. But guess what? They loved penmanship. They believed in the glory and beauty of penmanship. They were fanatics, almost martyrs, for penmanship. Such idiots can, on occasion, still be found in our schools, thank God. I've also been told that there are, are still a few zealots for long division, as well as at least a handful of experts in the multiplication table. Not to mention lunatic worshippers of the binomial theorem. There may even be one or two of those. Well, there are also those I call grammatomaniacs. That's my own word, grammatomaniacs, who, when faced with a split infinitive, suffer as you and I would suffer under gastroenteritis. Today the system, whatever its new incarnation might be, has most every teacher tightly in its grasp. The goal is to convert all teachers into functioning as, as mere technicians. It orders them to teach by formulas that are as baffling to the student as they are paralyzing to the teacher. The teaching profession, such as it is, doesn't need technicians or formulas or machines. What it needs is the enthusiasm of the aforementioned idiots. <laughs> I can hear dissents rising. Some will say that what I am proposing will expose the children of this republic to daily contact with monomaniacs, and some with half-wits. Well, I say, what of it? The vast majority of our young are already in daily contact with half-wits <clears throat> in their own homes. What I'm really saying here is that when it comes to teaching, enthusiasm is more important, far more important, than technique. I'd even go so far as to say that enthusiasm is more important than intelligence. Besides, there is no way that we can or, or should hope to fill our schools with men or women of high intelligence. Such people, such people will simply refuse to spend any significant portion of their adult lives trying to hammer such banal things as arithmetic or spelling or even good penmanship into the heads and hands of the young. Critics of my approach will no doubt accuse me of celebrating, or at least conceding, the cerebral inferiority of the pedagogue. All I am really saying here is that we ought to concentrate finding would-be teachers whose habits of mind are naturally on the plane of a child. In brief, the best teacher of children is one who is essentially childlike himself. By that I mean the best teacher is someone full of passion, someone capable of reducing knowledge to that simple compound of the obvious and the wonderful, so that can be magically slipped into the child's mind.